if you get your views from television news you'll only hear stories that corporations choose you'll only get to see what they want you to see you're gonna have to read and decide what you believe we it'll, all it'll be after that's all done horror 911 the planes hit the towers and the towers came down did you ever wonder how they fell so fast well maybe that's a question that we're not supposed to ask don't you think it's strange there were no fighter jets did someone give the order not to intercept if they really scrambled then why'd they fly so slow maybe there's an answer that we don't want to know and where was our president George W that fool he was visiting with children at an elementary school and when he heard the news he didn't seem concerned he just calmly read a picture book while all those people burned The Bushes and Bin Ladens Now what's that all about? While all of us were grounded They flew his family out Osama got his training From the CIA Our soldiers took Afghanistan They let him slip away A new Pearl Harbor was their big chance to launch two wars that they'd planned in advance. Now we know they lied about weapons in Iraq. Did they allow the 9-11 attack? If you get your views from television news You'll only hear stories that corporations choose You'll only get to see what they want you to see You're gonna have to read and decide what you believe I'm Bill Olson, your host for another episode of Omega Presents. This time it's a special one. We're in Studio A, a much bigger studio, and we're hosting the Portland 9-11 Truth Alliance. Here we have Barry, Mike, and Tim, and I'm not going to waste any more time. We'll just turn it right over to them and enjoy the show. Thank you, Bill, for the opportunity. And uh, yes, we are from PDX 911 Truth in uh, Portland, Oregon, and we meet at Laughing Horse Bookstores on Wednesday. And feel free to join us. Uh, today is like a community forum. We have uh, the audience, the public has come to ask questions and 
comment and give their expert research about 9-11, as has the panel. We have Barry Ball, you've been researching for years, correct, in this subject? True. And Tim Tutrid has uh, also many years put into this. Just a couple years, too. A couple years. Um, so what's happened is, as far as the mainstream media goes, it's a closed book. 9 is behind us. But yet on the internet, millions of people are checking into websites and all of this research has come forward about 9-11 and many smoking guns have been revealed. So we're going to go through a list of smoking guns about 9-11. Uh, we have 150. We certainly won't get through all of them today, but we'll get through um, uh, several of them. And many DVDs and films have been released. Um, all throughout um, the world, actually, um, many, many researchers jumping into this topic. So we're going to start with um, the past and false flag events. And I want to ask Tim and Barry, uh, describe what a false flag event is and maybe give an example of one. Yeah, we all know that false flag basically is killing your own people and then blaming it on someone else. It's basically the general thrust of that. And if you look into our military manuals, um, you'll find it right in there in written form that they teach it actually in, in uh, military uh, ideology and training. Um, so that false flag basically goes clear back to primitive times, even into Rome. Uh, it's well known that Rome created their own enemies by killing some of their own people and then blaming it on someone else. Uh, Machiavellian strategy is right. to also pit one side against the other. Right. To divide, divide and burn Rome to blame on the Christians. Is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me read smoking gun number one. In 1962, the U.S. military drafted plans known as Operations Northwoods to commit terror in U.S. cities and kill innocent Americans to trick the public into supporting a war against Cuba. Any comments on no Operations Northwoods? Barry, what do you think? <laughs> well, basically, <laughs> it's a template. Uh, this remained hidden for almost 40 years before uh, Jim Bamfield found... Bamford found uh, the documents and wrote uh, the NSA document um, body of evidence. And uh, if anybody cares to look into it, it, it basically is outlined in his book. But the 1962 Northwoods plan called for blowing up um, in terrorist style killing people on the streets of the United States, especially in Florida, Cubans, and calling for uh, radio-controlled plane painted, um, drones painted as if they were Cubans, and um, having a false manifest on for one of our own planes and then shooting them down. Now, Nemnitzer, who was um, this all following the uh, Bay of Pigs incident, uh, was still pushing with it out of the Eisenhower administration into the Kennedy administration. But Kennedy wouldn't have anything to do with it. So the, the document remained around undercover until it was discovered. But many of these facets had to do with the very things that happened on 9-11. So that's where I want to leave it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let's jump ahead two years to 1964 and uh, our military wanting very much involvement in Vietnam, but they needed an incident. What mm -hmm. happened in 64, Tim? Well, you know, again, Barry, you're probably more up to that. You had the well, Gulf of Tonkin incident where they, the North Vietnamese, um, we, we wanted to blame them for some incident to get more into the war. So wasn't there like a, f we faked like they tried to blow up one of our ships and uh, it never really happened. And so that got us deeper into the, into the war. Well, uh, Lyndon Johnson's uh, presidential tapes have been declassified and he has admitted that admitted in, in mm -hmm. the uh, Gulf of Tonkin incident. Mm -hmm. He talked about that, any further comment? Yeah, this was an old ship. In fact, I had been on the Maddox <laughs> uh, prior to it going over to Vietnam when I was uh, younger, uh, more impressionable, I guess you might say. And uh, yeah, he admitted that he, in fact, was cognizant of the fact that it was all a lie, that these these smaller gunboats had attacked, and really they hadn't, and uh, so it was used. And basically, uh, what we know, it was protecting a lot of drug trafficking coming out of Vietnam into the United States, 
um, and a number of other uh, high-level CIA-controlled uh, conspiracies were being covered by the Vietnam War. And, and so this conspiracy was very important uh, to these um, neocons to create a war, a false flag, and blame it on the Vietnamese in order to start a war. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the USS Liberty, that's an example, 1967, where um, during the 1967 war, they, the Israelis bombed the, our own ship, the USS Liberty, to blame on Egypt. And so that's an actual false flag that actually people, many American soldiers died. And uh, Yeah, so now let's get into 9-11. Uh, let me read Smoking Gun number five. And any of you can get this list. Go to your computer, Yahoo or Google, and type in 9-11 and Smoking Guns, and you will get this list. In April of 01, NORAD requested a war game event of having a terrorist group hijack a commercial airline and fly it into the Pentagon. But wasn't it Condi Rice that said uh, we could never imagine uh, airplanes flying into buildings? Didn't she say that? Yes, she did. And yet, <coughs> we've had these drills. Yeah. With NORAD. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about war games. Explain that, that concept. Uh, war games were going on something that basically uh, hasn't been talked about a lot. Uh, David Ray Griffin's books do not illuminate. He was criticized when he was here a year and a half ago for not mentioning the war games because the idea is that there were a number of war games going on that took planes elsewhere out of the country into uh, the North American continent above uh, the United States, out to sea, and that basically somebody turned this whole exercise live. Uh, this was maximized uh, by Alex Jones recently when he did Terror Storm, talking about the same strategy being used in England where the train bombings were created when they were right in the middle of there being war exercises for terrorism. Somebody turns it live, so you have the explosions up through the bottoms of the, uh, the trains. And uh, it's a very parallel incident. You can also go to Spain and see the same thing, that in the midst of all of the exercises, somebody turns them alive, mm -hmm. turns them live. And that's why last summer we were a little bit nervous in Portland. There was a war game, a couple of different war games. So would they go live or not? And so our group tried to expose that. And so if you expose it, they cannot go live because we say, well, this may go live. And if it actually does, then shows that our prediction was true. So that's one way of stopping these things. Well, you've got to ask yourself, what are the odds that the military would be conducting an exercise of planes crashing into the World Trade Center and a group of Arabs on the exact same day at the exact same time would actually crash planes into the same buildings? What are the odds of that happening at the same time? It's never going to happen. Seems ridiculous pretty mm -hmm. ridiculous yeah let, let me throw this one out here there's all kinds of little trivia people don't know about 9-11 uh, I like to get into the details number nine on September 7th Jeb Bush who's the governor of Florida puts the Florida National Guard on alert alert four days before 9-11 uh, were any of you aware of that yeah he actually called martial law I believe too so uh, before what did that, he know well, yeah how did he know <laughs> isn't he so, related to someone who yeah, uh, maybe so in the White House Right, and yeah. as we all know, you know, our President Bush was in the schoolhouse in Florida reading a pet book story. So if, they, if it didn't go well, right, they needed, the state of Florida needed to be on martial law to make sure that they're, you know, they could handle the situation. That's but, why I see you would call martial law. And if we're under attack and Bush is in a public place in a room full of children, shouldn't the Secret Service have whisked him out immediately? Sure, of course. That's protocol, isn't it? Well, Andrew Card comes in and whispers in his ear, and he doesn't even change expression on his face. He knew. And people who look at this from the outside of the United States, like Matthias Brokers, who's written a very influential article from Germany, uh, points this out. He said, if you didn't know anything else about 9-11, all you would have to do is get in on the story of, President Bush reading My Pet Goat and the way he reacted to it and you would know that it was more than 
you could ever believe that right. he <laughs> I've actually had friends tell me, well, he, he stayed in the classroom because he didn't want to upset the children. And it's so, so silly, you know. Yeah. It's like all he had to do was tell the teacher, can you finish the story? I, and I got to go, thanks for being here, kids. You know. Well, the other thing is when Air Force One went up into the air, it, right after he was taken out of Saragossa, you know, the elementary school where he was reading, um, and the plane circles around Saragossa without any fighter support. Since when does Air Force One exist without some kind of support? So there had to be some pre-knowledge that it wasn't needed. Mm -hmm. You have to make those kind of assumptions and connections. Right. Let's go to number 14. Attorney General John Ashcraft stops flying commercial aircraft three months before 9-11. Pretty interesting, huh? W I wonder what he knew. Right, right. And there was the mayor of San Francisco. Who uh, 19. San Francisco yeah. Mayor Willie Brown receives travel warning eight hours before the attacks, according to San Francisco Chronicle. And... Um, you know, Willie Brown never quite said who warned him. I think he mm -hmm. made a brief statement, and then uh, we never found out. No, I don't but that would be did. interesting to know. So, if you research the subject, there were plenty of warnings, weren't there, ahead of time? Mm -hmm. And certainly, other countries were warning us. Right. Israeli intelligence and foreign right. intelligence. Well, it goes back further than that. Uh, 1999, uh, Sandra Hicks talks about uh, Randy Glass who was being used as a setup for the ISI in New York, uh, where Mohammed from the ISI looks out the window and he says, those two buildings out there won't exist. They had to know that there was something planned. Of course, we already know about the stock market puts that were there, and still even the 9-11 you know, Commission could never ask any questions about that. No. It's just amazing that in plain sight is where it's all being hidden. A lot of money made, a lot of people made money on uh, betting on these airline stocks. Right, the good stocks, never right. investigated that. I think we have a question from our audience. Go ahead, sir. Uh, yes, Speak yes. up. Uh, hold on a sec. There we go. Could you, could you guys comment on uh, the Department of uh, Norman Mineta? Norman Mineta, the Secretary of the Department of sure. uh, Transportation. Sure, absolutely. Uh, he was a witness that day. He went down into the White House basement and he saw Dick Cheney uh, directing a military operation. Well, he and was, he claimed that he wasn't, I mean, Mineta uh, told a whole different story than Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld said that he wasn't there until 10.02 in the, uh, you know, in the bunker. And yet Mineta said he was there by 9.15 so that all these uh, things and these young men who came into the bunker at that time, is the plan still in place? Is the plan still in place? At which Rumsfeld said yes. And that's why we end up with the knowledge that there was some kind of stand down, that planes were st stood down. So that piece that you're talking about, uh, Mr. McManus, is is very important to this whole story. You, you meant Cheney, right? Cheney. Of Rumsfeld. Yeah. Well, Rumsfeld. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, uh, there was a military personnel there, and he said, uh, "Sir, the plane is, you know, 20 miles from the the building, the Pentagon. Do the orders still stand?" And Cheney said, "Yes, the orders still stand." And then later on, he said, uh, "The plane is 10 minutes from the Pentagon, 10 miles out. Does the orders still stand?" And Cheney said, "Yes, the orders still stand." Well, what order was that? Yeah, uh, this, it's very interesting to me, though, that the jets go so fast. And so within only a few seconds, I would think that um, it would be, you know, the story is he st starts out with, I think, 40 miles out and 30 miles out and so on. Yeah. But uh, I don't know how long a time it actually takes to go mm -hmm. from 40 to The only miles order it could possibly be is to not shoot down the plane, Right, is what I'm getting at. Yeah. If the order was to shoot yeah. it down, they would have done so. Do right. you have a follow-up? Yeah, yet the, the irony is we were never actually shown any footage of, uh, of the scene of the Pentagon until the fifth anniversary in September 2006. We were shown a quick, blurry clip, yet prior to that, there was no photographs of any uh, luggage or plane or engines or the front of the plane, the tail of the plane. 
and uh, we were immediately told, you know, we need to go after the person who did this. Bin Laden is mentioned 40 seconds into, uh, I think, uh, after the second building was hit. And it's crazy that the uh, 43 minutes of time passed between the time in which the second building was hit and the Pentagon was hit. 43 minutes of time is certainly enough time for the military to respond to uh, you know, a plane going off course, which happens on an average of a couple times a week. Back then it was happening about a couple times a week, and yet there was no response. We were immediately told we need to uh, go to war right away. As a matter of fact, I heard, uh, I heard on the uh, radio a couple of weeks after 9-11, I heard on the radio George Bush say that this would be a 30-year war. And that, to me, that along with being told that uh, I didn't realize initially that the buildings stood there, the two buildings stood there, Trade Center 1 and 2 stood there for an hour and an hour and three quarters, and then they fell to the ground in eight and ten seconds. I, I thought they fell immediately after the planes hit them. No, they didn't. But uh, the Pentagon, if you look at the pictures, what you see is about a 16-foot hole that's perfectly round. Uh, as to where the wings fit in that hole, they don't, because the wingspan of the plane was 125 feet. Uh, any comments about the initial Pentagon well, scene? Yeah, the Pentagon is a very special story because um, you had s huge spools. They've been working on the Pentagon for several years to re uh, to strengthen it on that particular side. Now you got a picture, Rumsfeld completely on the other side. Why wouldn't they crash it into that side if they were really after and trying to do some severe ba damage to our uh, to the Pentagon? But these huge spools. Uh, were sitting out there and yet they were totally undamaged right where the plane would have hit the building. Second thing is we need to notice is that if in fact the, the plane hit, the, there was a plane that hit the building at the point where that hole is that Mike was just talking about, you would have the engines which are below the plane dug into the ground several feet and you don't see any of that kind of damage out there. Well, Barry, how many blades of grass were damaged on mm. the Pentagon lawn? Absolutely <laughs> none. Zero, not even five? So if it Did came in that mean, close to the ground, you certainly mm. would have burned grass. Scorched, scorched yeah. earth. Well, Absolutely. I'm sure the Pentagon developed a special type of grass. Pentalon. Pentalon. <laughs> <laughs> Pentalon. So, you know, we've developed a black <laughs> morbid humor about uh, some of this stuff. You almost have to. But, but you would um, also have a lot of debris, too. The, any plane crash, you got wings and you got engines and luggage, luggage and seats and people, and there was none of Nothing. that. Nothing. So. Uh, I only saw one or two ambulances. Supposedly there would have been a lot of bodies and people who would need help, but it was a pretty limited scene there. And what, 80 cameras capturing the action? 84 cameras, and uh, none of them uh, were, as already mentioned by our questioner, became available until much later. You know, and even then, you never see any kind of a object hit the building, even when they released that piece with the fire. Um, you know. Now, there were witnesses that saw a plane, of course. Some of us believe it was a drone that had uh, maybe a small type of airplane that had wings that may have looked like a plane from a distance. Well, they found one engine out there which was not a 757 uh, jet engine. Mm -hmm. It was more like an engine that would be in a uh, cruise missile that they use uh, for a cruise missile. And, of course, that's what you have to suspect because uh, the damage going through three walls of three feet cement uh, would have to entail some kind of bunker buster power, wouldn't it, right. Mike? Absolutely. I, I would think, though, that an engine wouldn't survive through that. Some people oh. just believe that the engine is just planted evidence, and they just went to the, their junkyard and picked up any engine they could. It doesn't really match, and they just planted it. It's hard to know. It's super hard. It was really hard to get information on the Pentagon because everything went to the Twin Towers, all the media. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember hardly anything after the first day, to be honest with you. Well, Mike, what is really amazing about all this is, you know, we referred to Condoleezza Rice. We can't imagine that anything would ever, you know, planes would ever hit the building, you know, and all of this talk. And we've had all the talk about in the PNAC how we needed a new, uh, a new Pearl Harbor. Why don't you explain that a bit more? <laughs> <laughs> well, Brzezinski uh, helped formulate a statement uh, several years before 9/11 about if we were to have uh, 
credibility in the world and power in the world, we would need a new Pearl Harbor to marshal all of the support of the American people. And, and actually, Pearl Harbor was mentioned in that. So with all of this having been said, uh, one of the things that came out of all the comments was that it was sudden. It was like Pearl Harbor. All of this happened so sudden we never expected it, and yet within an hour, we have Jerome Hewer speaking on television. It's been a, uh, a man identified as having worked in Giuliani's emergency office uh, in Building 7, who's out there on the streets portraying a man just walking by and saying, and yet explaining immediately who did it. And suddenly we know within an hour who did it, all the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing when, you know, we could never imagine this, and yet now suddenly we have the whole story within an hour. As far as these 19 people who crashed uh, the planes into our building, actually we found out a few days later that six of them at least, according to The Guardian and the BBC in England, are alive and well. Right. So shouldn't there yeah. have been an update of the 19 people at that point, or shouldn't they have course, changed the, the list? The media and the government work together. So you think the, uh, if it was a legitimate media, they would you know, look more into these 19 hijackers, but they just keep things quiet. So and the so list was never changed, was it? it to this day, either. even though six of them are right. alive and well in Europe, we're not a part of this at all. Right. Yeah, and that's even a big smoking gun. And even Bin Laden is not even accused on the FBI's ten wanted list as having been responsible for 9/11. So Bin Laden himself is not even implicated in the accusations, the criminal accusations. And, yeah, and the first thing <laughs> that really put up a red flag in a lot of our minds was if you remember no one could fly uh, there was a stand down for three days none of us could except for who the family of bin laden do you remember that yeah. right. they were allowed to gather together and get out of the country and Isn't after that crazy and after that stand down uh, flight 93 was seeing all over the area of pennsylvania there was a white plane even during the time that there was supposed to be a stand down of all aircraft in the whole country. Which is amazing itself, if the FAA is so insignificant and um, not credible, how would they pull down a stand down all over the country? That's another interesting question, which I think... Yeah, Barbara has a question. A uh, question in the audience? Uh, yeah, I have a question, because you brought up uh, Building 7. Not yet. But go ahead. <laughs> we were getting to that. I mean, I, I know, uh, like, the towers, everybody, you know, understands. But I've heard a lot about building number seven, which makes me know there were other buildings there. Uh, I didn't uh, – tell us a little bit about what happened to building seven, because, I mean, uh, we've sure. not heard anything about that. It wasn't in the commission's report, and uh, yet I know it was like a – I think it was a 47-story building. We don't have one in Portland that tall. It was quite large. Tim, yeah. why don't you talk about that? Yeah, Building 7 that came down, free fall speed at 5.20 in the afternoon. It's just like uh, Barbara said, it, the media covered it that day, and it really wasn't talked about at yeah, all never. after that. No. And uh, so free fall speed, if you drop a grand piano from 47 stories, that building came down the same time. So, I mean, Newton's law, second law, that basically it violates that unless there's extra energy added so there's different theories were, were there explosions put in was it other devices put in to bring that building down so Tim th you know you mentioned the media being complicit why don't you tell us tell us about why it was that 20 minutes before the building fell we had CNN announcing that the building had fallen and yet you could still see the building standing in behind yeah. this well, they have, uh, reporter. Yeah, I mean, they have <laughs> ESP in the media. They know what's going to happen beforehand. They're <laughs> or do they have a script? A script, yeah. That they're they, following. That could happen, too. Um, one of the biggest smoking guns is that a year later, PBS did a documentary, and they interviewed Larry Silverstein. He is the leaseholder of this building. He's in charge of Building 7. And he said that, I, you know, we met with the fire chiefs, we had a meeting, and we decided to pull it. Um, that's a demolition term. Pull it, mm -hmm. right? That means that can only right. mean one thing: pull, pull the building. 
Well, later on then he said, no, I meant to pull all the firemen out of there. Well, he knew that all the firemen were already out of the building. Yeah. In fact, everyone was out of the building. And he collected uh, billions of dollars in insurance policy and, um, you know, made quite a lot of money. And we're going to pause here for a bit uh, and we're going to show you a tape. Now, we don't want this just to be about problems and giving you bad news. We want to offer you a solution. And a solution is a third party going beyond Republicans and Democrats. So we're going to hear someone talk from the Constitution Party. We're not endorsing it or anything, but let's look outside the box mm -hmm. at other solutions. And so his name is Scott Simra, and he has looked into 911, and he's going to talk about it himself. And he's running for office with the, the first district. First district, Constitu Constitution Party. Let's go ahead with that clip. Running um, for the House, for the Constitution Party. Good morning, here. Okay, there's 15 and 15. No problem. I'll try and keep it short. Uh, well, thank you for uh, hosting this. Uh, it's too bad there's not more people here, as other people have mentioned. It's kind of sad. But uh, thank you for your concern. And um, I'll start with 9 11 since that's the group that uh, invited me. Um, I had a couple of strange reactions you might say on 9-11. I'll just tell you one true reaction that I had on 9-11. I was um, watching the TV and I was watching the footage of the Pentagon and I saw the helicopters hovering over and I saw the photos taken of the front lawn and I, I did not see any engine, engine remnants of an engine, fuselage, bodies, um, tail piece, nothing. And I remember, I think I pretty much yelled at the TV. I said, are you kidding me? There's no plane here. What are you talking about? And complete disbelief. And that was before any talk of conspiracy theories came up or, you know, any, that was before the government's conspiracy theory came up within the next few days, magically. Um, so I've always had a very, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat cynical, but I think my... Um, sense of perception is actually pretty strong in, in life in general. And that's just one reaction that I had to it. And so through the years, um, the last six or seven years, I've spent literally hundreds of hours studying 9-11. Um, and I've read all the books and the videos, seen the videos, and I've been pass I've passed out videos on 9-11, left and right. And I've been extremely frustrated at the lack of, first of all, the lack of concern uh, to even study 9-11. And then I'm that I also am very frustrated at people's, you know, sometimes the hostility or reaction against me for even suggesting that somebody in power or, you know, might, might be responsible for these events. Um, so, through, through the past years, I have tried to get people to open their minds. And slowly, as years have gone on, uh, for instance, my mom has come around you know, 180 degrees, and she's she starts telling people, look at look at the, look at this video, study the study 9/11, you know, spend some time like Charlie Sheen, you know, he he goes on TV and says, okay, America, just just do me a favor and study what happened. This is and uh, like you were saying, 9/11 is a linchpin event. It's a, basically a Pearl Harbor event. It's what they the PNAC um, authors asked or requested was a a, not a, a Pearl Harbor type of event. Um, is what they said they needed to basically build the, rebuild the empire in the Middle East. And that's on the PNAC website, you know. Cheney and company wrote, wrote these words. So um, you look at the evidence, you look at World Trade Center 7, the Pentagon photos, the black, black boxes, where are they, why are they missing, et cetera. Um, the, you know, the Pentagon photos that um, are being held. Um, the list goes on and on and on. I think if you listen to the people who are closest to the event, the, sur the survivors and the family members of the victims, just start with them and see what they want. They're the ones who were responsible for getting the investigation performed in the first place. So you have to ask yourself, why did the federal government not want to investigate the biggest crime on American soil ever? And you, Unless you're not using your mind and you're just going on emotion, um, you have to suspect that the evidence shows there was clearly um, a plot that involved more than the, you know, what the government tells us actually happened. Um, so for me, I would support, obviously, um, reopening, uh, do a truly independent investigation into 9-11 and make the president and other people involved go on oath 
And I, I know there's been one or two, at least one or two lawsuits that have been brought to implicate the president and vice president, and that's great. We gotta get these people to testify one way or the other and get them on record, take oaths. Um, a lot of people don't even know that, that you know, the president and vice president refused to, to go on oath about 9-11. So if people just need to study. And I'm, I'm trying to do my part um, as a citizen and handing out videos and doing that. And so the next step for me in 9-11 is one issue, along with other issues, many other issues. Um, I'm a citizen who's just become really indignant and frustrated. And I don't think I can live with myself if I can't pursue justice um, how I feel I need to pursue justice. And I think it is a, government is important because le federal legislation has a huge impact um, on, our, on our lives and our society. And, and it's very important. Um, so. I'm going to do my part and offer the citizens of my district uh, an opportunity to um, go forward on some of these issues. Um, tied to that, um, Iraq and Afghanistan, obviously we were lied to, or we were deceived, and I see this too as a, as a story of empire which has gone on for decades, and even you can argue over a hundred years, uh, it's basically a form of neo-colonialism if you, if you want to tell the truth. Um, one thing I've been refreshed about in the last seven years is I've kind of let down my guard and I'll read anybody. I'll read left, right wing, anarchist, whatever. And I will read anything as long as people are telling me facts and, and the truth. And I one of my favorite authors is Noam, Noam Chomsky. You know, he's labeled a you know an anarchist or off the charts, but if you just even reading Noam Chomsky, he tells you about NSC sixty eight and the documented plans that our government had at World War Two and after to carve up the world essentially and um, take the lead as the you know the corporate uh, uh, kind of war empire, and you read about um, things like that. You see, it's just a continuation of uh, I would say a colonialism, a, a control, a power that the Western nations have kind of imposed on the world. And I would propose, yeah, pulling our troops out of Iraq and Afghanistan as soon as possible, and pulling our troops out of all the other countries that you're talking about, except for a few where we have some legitimate treaties pulling the troops out of those countries. I would demand that um, and put legislation forth that would that would just make it simple and plain. This is what we need to do. Um, it's easy to make justification that these wars are not constitutional, et cetera. I can do all that. Um, so that's that'll be one of my plans is to you know, pull out of Iraq and Afghanistan immediately. Um, and obviously if you study that situation you realize you talk about the oil uh, and, the, and the pipelines and you can I can get into all that if I need to when I'm proposing legislation and provide the evidence. Uh, that wouldn't be a problem. You also need to talk about um, the oil and purchasing of oil in, in, in euros versus uh, dollars, and that's the, that's a huge issue. Is that a lot of okay? That was Scott Semra with the Constitution Party, and it's just you know a possible solution. We've really got to look at some other parties and other alternatives here because the two main parties are not touching 911. Uh, you two met him. Any comments about Scott? Yeah, he's a very intelligent man. He's very well read. And uh, a lot of people look at the Constitution as being way to the far right, and they don't want to even touch it. But when you actually meet people that belong to the Constitution Party, I've met a lot of them, and they're, they're very well educated, and they seem to have a closer sense of reality. And so um, I think people should look into them. And uh, at our forum, we also had... He was. He spoke at our forum on July 10th. We had the Green Party candidates and one of the Dem candy uh, from the Democratic Party. But um, seemed like the far left and far right seemed to be a little bit closer to reality. And the Constitution Party candidates had more of a clue. On 9/11. On 9/11, definitely. Yeah. One thing we, you know, we interpret sanity. We should interpret sanity in all of us as some kind of rigorous uncertainty. And that's what I think that Scott presents. He's, he's reading, he's open. Uh, so many of our politicians and our educators are closed. And that's even a definition of insanity. So when you look at the Constitution Party and Scott, what you're really seeing is a guy who's looking at the details of what's going on. And as Tim already pointed out, when you get to the other end of it, you wonder, uh, where are the details? Where's the beef? You know, um, I know when we had the other speaker at the other end for the Green Party, uh, Michael uh, Mayo, he spent most of his time saying that none of the false flags that we just talked about here were really relevant up to 50 years. No one was really going to be able to tell anything about them. And I 
totally disagreed with him on that issue for sure, because those are very important to trying to understand 9-11. Okay, we're going to get to the audience in just now. a moment and talk about airline pilots, which is important. But I want to mention uh, a great website. We're each going to give out one website and one book, so get out a pencil right now. 911truth.org is an excellent site. And um, the book I want to recommend is um, probably uh, Inside Job by Jim Morris is an excellent book. Tim? Well, the website that I, I look at every day I go to f for my news is Infowars.com. Right I think it's very good. Mm -hmm. And it's by Alex Jones, and he made a film called Terror Storm, and I think that's yeah. a very good film. Yeah, and they also, Truth Rising is a new film about the activism, 9-11 activism. So those are, yeah, I think people should very. check that out. Yeah, I, I'd like to recommend for those that want to feel what is going on, <laughs> as well as just knowing what's going on, is basically uh, uh, Kevin Barrett's Truth Jihad uh, against... In other words, the 9-11 big lie. And it's his, his personal story about how he was fired from his teaching job as a, um, a studier of myth and legend at the University of Wisconsin because of his uh, connection with 9-11 and trying to tell the truth. The other book I would mention would be David Ray Griffin. He just uh, put out a book, oh, let's see, about two and a half months ago called 9-11 Contradictions. And in that book, he takes 25 of the key contradictions that appear in his previous books, like uh, the new Pearl Harbor mm -hmm. or uh, debunking the 9-11 debunkers, mm -hmm. uh, which is an excellent uh, summary of his positions in terms, his main, Contribution is showing how the 9-11 Commission is a total series of lies to the American public in sort of feeding into the whole myth about 9-11 being a need to go to war, a need to enrich the war profiteers, etc. So right, and, and don't forget Loose Change. Uh, it's free on the Internet. Millions of people have watched the film Loose Change. Okay, let's have a question from our audience about pilots. Well, what I was going to say is that when you were talking about the Pentagon and the airplane uh, that flew to it or near it or into it, whichever, <laughs> uh, pilots for 911truth.org did an excellent analysis. They're a group of commercial pilots who formed a, an organization just so they could analyze the peculiar anomalies. And they, what they found, among other things, is that the and this brings up the question, why couldn't the government, if they're going to do a con job, why couldn't they make one that fit their own story? I mean, the, the, the flight data recorder data said that the plane flew 200 feet above the Pentagon. So take it from there, I guess. In, uh, and Tim mentioned Infowars.com, the site that I have a roll in from a site done by Alex Jones, and that's the uh, Prison Planet TV. And that brings me to this rolling. Do you mind if I do that rolling now? Or do you have something um, else going on? I don't think but we're going to have time today, but maybe the next time. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. then I'll, I'll show, on the next show, I'll show the, the okay. uh, Kevin okay. Ryan roll-in. We've identified uh, a possible source of the thermate as the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. Stay tuned to the August 2nd edition for the Come rest of that Come back in info. two weeks for that. Okay, for back sure. to you guys. Okay. Well, Bill, I think it's real interesting you bring up uh, all kinds of groups have come forward. You mentioned the air, the air, you know, pilots, and we had Richard Gage here in town recently, who, who backs a group of 280, 280 uh, architects and engineers. And they're for trying to extend that to a thousand by the end of the year. Yeah, it's yeah. just it's just uh, steamrolling into a huge thing. Uh, one of the negatives is that we sometimes don't talk to each other in the movement, and that's the part of it that we keep working at. There's so much information that, you know, each one of us can keep studying one little area of it and never interact with anybody else, and we do need to get together. Everybody can be an expert on his own field, but let's share that yeah. info. Right. So let's move on with our 911 facts and smoking guns. Uh, no steel frame building before or since 9-11 has ever collapsed due to a fire. And if you remember, there was a building in Spain recently, and the whole structure burned, but all of the steel frames remained. Remember that? Right, right. right. I know that the debunkers, they nitpick that and say, well, I think it's the McCormick House or McCormick Place in Chicago that collapsed. But that wasn't a, 
that's a, sure it's a steel structure building but it's not a multiple multiple story structure just a, like a large hangar basically so everybody can nitpick here and there but it's basically it's, it's a, a definition of high rise versus right. maybe low rise is that what we're saying so it's a tall building but it's not a um, but it's not considered not a, a high a, rise it's not a story building yeah. right you know it's more like a so we have a crime scene there when all of this steel falls to the ground and what happened to that crime scene in that steel well if you listen to uh, judy wood it disappeared you know with directed energy if you listen to m many of the people who follow uh, stephen jones it was carted away to uh, asia and sold as scrap metal but that's a a felony to come into a crime scene and you've used that term very appropriately Mike that it was a crime scene mm -hmm. and how you can go With in and just take all the elements of a crime scene 3,000 dead bodies yeah, yeah. and the, like, very few I don't think any bodies were identified were they it just became dust so yeah I don't know if there's any and uh, I want to briefly mention a speaker we had named William Rodriguez and he was uh, mm -hmm. one of the head janitors of the building uh, number one the head janitor the head janitor yeah. and according to his um, testimony he heard uh, an explosion or a bomb below in the basement before he heard the plane and at least six seconds before the before the explosion above whether or not you know that was plain or not it was an explosion above but it was definitely several seconds before down below down below and one and of his colleagues came up mm -hmm. all burned burned, burned. Yeah, so it was from like below from, from, from below an mm -hmm. explosion obviously of yeah. some kind what else could it be right right, right. Uh, let's go to a question from the audience uh, yeah you guys were mentioning a little earlier about uh, good resources I just wanted to mention a few uh, DVDs and a few websites that I like. Uh, the DVDs are 9-11 In Plain Sight, 9-11 mm -hmm. Press for Truth, which is excellent for people uh, who are starting out with 9-11. It goes, it basically uh, studies the four women referred to as the Jersey Girls, uh, who basically pushed for the commission to begin, the 9-11 commission. Without them, the commission probably would not have happened. 9-11 Mysteries is another good film. And for websites, uh, Rents, R-E-N-S-E, dot com is very good uh, global research dot ca and if you really want to know a lot of the people who are involved in the 9-11 truth movement uh, people of stature credibility uh, patriots question 9-11 dot com thank you for that um, I actually want to mention Rosie O'Donnell at this point uh, when she was on her show the view she talked a lot about 911 in the last few weeks before she was taken off the air if you remember that and she talked a lot about how fire burns and it melts steel at a certain point in the temperatures. And it simply uh, wasn't hot enough. It's impossible. I think, you know, we've got to look at the overview of this whole thing. If you look at 9-11 Mysteries, um, or you look at any of these films of the buildings exploding, what you s that's exactly what you see is with the fire, you wouldn't get this huge explosion and parachute effect of all the debris coming down you, what you would have is either you know you would have something that resembled just a collapse of some kind you know it wouldn't include all this explosion what what created this explosiveness you know that's what you have to ask mm -hmm. I got another question um, but I just want to mention we should talk about what thermate is because uh, that, but that's an explosive that was found when the materials were analyzed they found thermate yeah. in the steel. Thermate is thermite with sulfur, a special ingredient that makes it um, more explosive. Um, anyway. Yeah, okay. Audience, question? Yeah, you guys uh, briefly touched on the Shanksville um, incident. And uh, for me, that was kind of the, the most smoking gun of everything because you can just look at it and you see there's a total lack of, you know, plane there's only a, a small piece of fuselage and they claim they dug up an engine from deep underground mm -hmm. but in fact uh, if you look at satellite images from 1994 there's there's a pre-existing scar that made up the, ma the majority of the Shanksville crash right. so I, I was just curious if you could think of another another example ever that a plane is basically vaporized it's never no. happened never no I was just gonna read number five let me read this there was no visible airplane debris where flight 93 supposedly crashed in Pennsylvania 
only a smoking hole in the ground, much like a bomb crater. Let's go ahead and what have you researched about? I know that. We'll get to it. What have, what have you researched about Pennsylvania? About Pennsylvania? Yeah, and the, where the engine, like he said, where it was found, it fits perfectly with a little dump, um, a little crane that could basically deposit that engine in there. And so it was, again, planted evidence, you know. Mm -hmm. w why is there just one engine that survived and nothing else? Isn't this where we found the headband also perfect intact? Sure. So you find but they like also that. found, actually, they found uh, within five-mile radius, they found little tiny pieces of this plane. And uh, people, at least five witnesses that I've researched, that saw a plane uh, explode, you know. And, of course, then you have to say to yourself, well, and they saw a white plane chasing after, you know, and, and so you have to say that they took this plane down. And yeah. uh, Some people bury the look at the evidence and say there was no plane at all mm -hmm. that flew over. So there was no, because of very the lack of any kind of uh, debris. Debris so, on the yeah. ground once on again, the ground. same so as the Pentagon. Well, it's such yeah. a small, even, you know, these witnesses saying there was an uh, explosion of some kind, but mm -hmm. there were such small little uh, microscopic pieces of an airplane, they could hardly tell what it was, mm -hmm. you know. And that was the plane with uh, Todd Beamer saying, let's roll and calling his wife. Right. And uh, it turns out that he had never <coughs> talked to his wife directly. And that cell phones may not have even worked at that Definitely didn't uh, work. level. Okay, caller, go ahead. Caller, go ahead. They'll patch it through. Hello. Sure, go ahead. There you go. You're not hearing me. We hear you now. We hear you. You do? <laughs> yes. Well, hi, this is Jan, and I'm sorry I'm not there. My car got vandalized, and I had to wait for the police. What's your question? Um, but I had a thought, and I'm having a real hard time hearing you um, without my TV, so this is the thought I had. Do you remember Flight 800 and people, I, I think it was, what, 98? And mm -hmm. it was going to France and mm -hmm. people in Long Island standing on the beach saw a missile. Now, mm -hmm. I think somehow this is connected and maybe they were just trying to judge reaction, but I remember months they put that plane together. I mean, they, they never let up on trying to figure out why did that plane just explode mm -hmm. when they had witnesses on the ground saying they saw a missile. So I think, you know, that this thing goes back so far. It makes me so sick and so angry. And I'm sorry I'm not there. And I'm going to lose my Internet service. So if you guys could let me know by phone next time you get together, I would really like to be there. Sure. Our group meets at Laughing Horse Books. You can contact them on Burnside. And we're on uh, Wednesdays. But thank you for bringing up Flight 800. Uh, any comments about that flight? Well, it was very interesting that you can put a plane together. If it, even if it's hit by a missile, and yet, as Tim's already mentioned, there isn't even enough out there to put anything together. And the so, parts are wrong. And the parts <laughs> are the wrong parts. So, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, there's many, many smoking guns. Uh, we talked about the, um, the people that made money on the put options. Remember that? And the mm -hmm. stock options. And uh, it's unbelievable that that was not part of the official investigation. Right. Because that would have led to a trail about who knew about it. Mm -hmm. Follow the money. Yeah, any court case, they would first look at that. So we know it wasn't a legitimate, you know. Well, let's talk commission. about who was on the commission, you know, people with oil interests. and Yeah. Uh, you know, who picked the commission? I, yeah, I believe Kissinger the first choice was Kissinger. Right, exactly. You know, Kissinger. A war criminal was Well, the after choice. they took their time, uh, after a great deal of pressure by the New Jersey girls and a number of... Um, legislature e people to even get an investigation right because that was the hardest thing and then you, and then when you do get to an investigation you pick Kissinger um, okay <laughs> so the fox guarding their hen house so here's Zelikow who has a very very clear uh, history with Bush and his his um, election campaign mm -hmm. and politics that go deep into the roots of what we would consider the dark side of 9-11. And then you look at his background, and what kind of background does Selikow have? He's academically trained in legend, 
and myth creation and manipulation. Yeah. Didn't he do a wonderful job with the 9-11 Commission putting out a myth that... Um, and he was also with him? Condi Rice long before that, yeah, helping true. to in many projects. So. But he, he very explicitly, right, Tim, leaves exactly. out all of the key information like the firemen. He very... He doesn't leave. He doesn't leave any room for Willie Rodriguez to tell his story. He was not um, allowed in the commission report. Right, and the and then there's no scientists on the commission at all to talk about the scientific reasons why the collapse occurred in the first place. Not one. I know we're winding down here. We have to mention NORAD, all right, because we have a system to <laughs> intercept airplanes, and uh, it completely failed on that day. And we've never gotten a, a clear explanation as to why. But let's talk about NORAD a bit. Okay. Well, did it fail? I mean, if it's an inside job, <laughs> it didn't fail, right? I mean, <laughs> come on. So it didn't I mean, perform it as didn't properly. Perform as uh, you know, it should have. Right. Right. So. And we intercept planes all the time within a few minutes. You right. Know? Right. So yeah. for the war games, a lot of the pilots were, I understand, off the coast of um, Atlantic and up in northern Canada and so on. So, But you know, if we really believe that uh, all of this is true, why are we spending so much energy on planes when they, in fact, in their fires, allegedly crashing into the building, why are we spending so much time worrying about this red herring of planes if, in fact, it was brought, they were, buildings were brought down with missiles and well, with, uh, you know, it, with it, explosives or directed energy well, you look or whatever. at the full story, Barry, you can't just say, well, we're just going to look at one aspect of it. To solve a mystery, you've got to look at every part of it. Yeah, but I'm just, I'm, I'm right. making a rhetorical right. question, right. you know, I understand it. It's just we need to put it into some sort of perspective, you know. We like to quibble back and forth and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all the time, <laughs> but we always go out for a beer afterwards. Um, I, I just want to mention one more key fact. A lot of people don't know this, but you know how they tape record the uh, conversations with the flight controllers and the pilots? Mm -hmm. uh, the management went into those um, offices and destroyed all of the tapes, so we don't have any conversation on that day of the uh, flight controllers talking to the pilots, if you recall. So to me, that's cover-up and conspiracy. So I'm going to throw it back to Bill. Do you have final comments and thoughts here? Well, I was just going to say that uh, we just had a caller who wanted to tell us to watch Fair and Hype 9-11 because the rest of us were full of you-know-what. And that's typical of people who don't listen to what you're saying. You know, we can go over the evidence over and over again, but, you know, people like that want to just... You know, I don't, I can't explain it, but we got to figure out a way to reach people like that. And uh, then about the explosives, I think the next show we'll cover the explosives. We t talked about airplanes and why they weren't reasonable. We'll talk about explosives next time. And uh, you can see all this on Google, folks. The, uh, this show will be on Google tonight uh, if I have something to say about it. Anyway, 9 11 was an inside <laughs> job. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank Bill, you. for having us. Thank you. Right on. Thank right you. On. And join us on August 2nd for another show at 5 p.m. on Channel 11.